Hey everyone, uh, we are here in chapter 22, slide 21. We've gone over the basics of uh, heart tissue, cardiac contractile cells, um, and the external superficial features of the heart, how to differentiate externally um, the base where the atria are and blood vessels are versus the apex where the ventricles are. Uh, here we're taking a closer look Oh, we also look at valves. Here we're taking a closer look at all that, but internally we're going to break down chamber by chamber. Let's start here on the right atrium. The right atrium in our illustration is here. The right atrium in this cadaver heart on the right side would be right here. The right atrium is receiving blood from three different places. It's receiving oxygen poor blood from veins. There are three different veins that it's receiving blood from. The superior vena cava, that's coming in this way. The inferior, inferior vena cava, which is coming up from behind here. The third place where blood is coming in from, is from the coronary sinus. The coronary sinus is part of the coronary circulation, blood that is delivered to the heart, to the myocardium of the heart and then returned back. You can see an opening of the coronary sinus right here. Well, you should use a different color. The opening of the coronary sinus is right here. And so it's, it's on the posterior side of the heart and it enters from the backside. We'll go over that in more depth later, but the three places that we receive oxygen poor blood from to the right atrium are the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and coronary sinus. The word sinus, we've seen the word sinus before, it just means larger, in this case, a larger blood vessel. <clears throat> I said that the atria compared to ventricles have less myocardium. They're not as strong and they don't need to be. They're just pumping blood to the ventricles. What they do need to do is expand. In order to expand, to hold more blood, these, the walls of the, uh, of the atrium have pectinate muscle. Pectinate muscle, as you can see here in this uh, cadaver view, when you look at the inside wall of the, of the, of the atrium, it's kind of got a texture. If you look at it from the side, it's kind of wavy looking. The word pectinate means comb-like. We've talked about pectoral muscles. Those are a little bit comb-like. These pectinate muscles are comb-like. Um, they can expand like an accordion. That waviness allows for volume increase without pressure increase. Oracles of the atria are lined with pectinate muscle that can expand. From the right atrium, we pump blood through the uh, tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. So here's the right ventricle. <clears throat> Still on the atrium, um, we have that septum, the wall, the wall between the left atrium and left, excuse me, left atrium and right atrium, that's the interatrial septum. And the interatrial septum is, has got a oval shaped depression. If you look at this cadaver heart, we've cut into the right atrium, it's been flapped open. And you can see in the septum, there's this oval depression here. The word for oval depression is fossa ovalis. Fossa ovalis. Why is there an oval shaped depression between the left and right atria? When we were fetuses in early development, and even for a few days when we were infants, or a few hours really, there was a hole a literal hole, a passageway called the foramen ovale. I know we have a foramen ovale in our skull. 
This is another foramenal valley, one of the heart. The foramenal valley that we had as a fetus allowed blood to pass between the right atrium and the, and the, and the left atrium. Why would we want a hole between the right atrium and left atrium? When we're fetuses, we could let blood go from the right atrium to the right ventricle and then from the right ventricle to the lungs. We could let it go to pulmonary circulation, but when we're fetuses, we're not breathing in any air. So really effectively, the pulmonary circulation isn't doing anything. What if, rather than going from the right atrium to the right ventricle, we send some blood that came from our mothers that has oxygen and nutrients, just send it straight to the left atrium so that we can go from the left atrium, left ventricle, and the rest of the body. This is a bypass from the right atrium to the left atrium through the foramen ovale. This is a bypass of the lungs, a bypass of pulmonary circulation. We don't want to send as much blood to the lungs. There's no need. Might as well make a shortcut. <clears throat> so like I said, we deliver blood from the right atrium to the right ventricle. We're going through the tricuspid valve. And the tricuspid valve is held down by chordae tendony that's anchored by a papillary muscle. You can see that over here on the right side in this cadaver heart. This actually might be a sheep heart, I forget, but it's a similar looking heart nonetheless. Um, you can see chordae tendony holding down, um, be, being held down by papillary muscle. This is the right ventricle, the anterior half. Um, and then here's the, tricuspid valve. <clears throat> Papillary muscles attached to these chordae tendony prevent inversion of this tricuspid valve. Blood flows from the right atrium to the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, we're going to pump blood out to the lungs, to the pulmonary circulation. The right ventricle is stronger than the right atrium, not as strong as the left atrium, excuse me, left ventricle. The right ventricle is not as strong as the left ventricle. Because it is stronger, it has adaptations to prevent suction. If you can imagine two suction cups, when you put two suction cups together, it sticks, which is good when you want it to suction, but we don't want our heart to suction. We want to, to squeeze and then release, squeeze and then release. To prevent suction, the texture of the muscle is ridged. The word for ridges, branches or ridges, is trabeculae. You've seen that word before. You saw trabeculae in bone and spongy bone. But these are muscular ridges. So these are trabeculae carniae. Trabeculae carniae are this ridged texture muscle that we see in the walls of the right ventricle. They prevent suction. On top of that, not only do we have trabeculae carniae, but we also have something called a moderator band. A moderator band is a muscular band that goes kind of horizontally from one side of the ventricle to the other. And this moderator band prevents overexpansion. Think of this as like a, like a leash, like a bungee. It can, your heart can expand this right ventricle can expand with blood, but we don't want it to overexpand. And it's not muscular enough to prevent overstretch. So we have this band to kind of hold things in place. So the trabeculae carni prevent suction, moderator band prevents overexpansion of the right ventricle. <clears throat> Another fetal adaptation. Whoops. Another fetal adaptation, we saw how blood can go from the right atrium into the left atrium when we're a fetus through that foramen ovale, but some blood will still keep going from the right atrium to the right ventricle. Then from the right ventricle out the pulmonary trunk to the pulmonary arteries. But once again, when you're a fetus, that blood isn't going to be doing much. You're not going to be getting any oxygen. So we have one additional bypass, so we can skip, have more blood skip this pathway. 
will still go into the pulmonary trunk, but some blood can go through this passageway right here. This is passageway in the fetus is known as the ductus arteriosus. It's an arterial duct. It goes from one artery from the pulmonary trunk into another artery, the aorta. Ductus arteriosus is what we have as a fetus. Once we're born, we no longer need that. We don't want that bypass. So just like how the foramen ovale closes up and be becomes the fossa ovalis, the ductus arteriosus closes up and becomes the ligamentum arteriosum. It's ligament-like. We get this connective tissue remnant that was in the, in the blood vessel. It closes off. And that closed off part is visible here. You can see it in the cadaver heart right here. It's just a seems insignificant piece, but that piece is connecting from the pulmonary trunk to the aorta. Right atrium, right ventricle, right ventricle, pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries, pulmonary capillaries, pulmonary veins to the left atrium. Here we are in the left atrium in this image right here. It's kind of hiding behind all these blood vessels. It's hiding behind the pulmonary trunk, behind the aorta. So it's kind of tucked away. It's more visible from the posterior side, actually. The left atrium is receiving oxygen-rich blood from the pulmonary veins. It also has pectinate muscles inside of its oracle. You can see that pectinate muscle here inside of the left atrium, that texture so that it can expand. Blood can then be pumped through the bicuspid valve. Bicuspid valve we've seen, like the tricuspid valve, is reinforced by, excuse me, uh, sorry, here it is, reinforced by cordy tendony attached to papillary muscle. Cordy tendony are here, and this large bump is a papillary muscle. The left ventricle, which is where the blood is now, after from the left atrium to left ventricle. Left ventricle is the thickest, most muscular part of your heart. It squeezes blood out to your systemic circulation, out the, out the aortic semilunar valve to the aorta to the rest of your body. Because it's so muscular, you need prominent trabeculae carnii to prevent suction, because when it squeezes, it's gonna really push the walls together. So it has prominent trabeculae carnii. Um, it does not need a moderator band. The walls are thick enough. There's minimal risk of it overexpanding just from it filling up a lot. It's not going to overfill. So hopefully you've seen how the heart acts a lot, like a piston in an engine. We have a relax relaxation phase where blood can fill. So the atria pump blood, send blood to the ventricles. And then when the ventricles squeeze, we pump blood out the pulmonary trunk or the aorta if we're going to pulmonary circulation or systemic circulation respectively. Let's go through this step by step. <clears throat> this animation is from, um, from uh, Crash Course on YouTube. So we have our atria up here. We have the right atrium and the left atrium. We have the right ventricle and the left ventricle. They take turns pumping. Atria, then ventricles. Atria, then ventricles. Let's say we're starting, in this animation, we're starting in the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, we squeeze, pump blood out the pulmonary semilunar valve, pulmonary trunk to the pulmonary arteries. From the pulmonary arteries, we branch to capillaries, and then we exchange gases here in the alveoli of the lungs. So here we are exchanging gases of the pulmonary capillaries. Blood is now oxygenated. We return that oxygenated blood through pulmonary veins. There are four of them, two on either side, to the left atrium. From the left atrium, let me start, oops. 
From the left atrium, we pump blood through the bicuspid valve into the left ventricle. From the left ventricle, we go through the semilunar valve, aortic semilunar valve to the aorta to systemic circulation. It goes to the rest of the body. So we get blood going through to uh, your brain, to your heart, to the heart, to coronary circulation, to your arms, to your legs, and eventually it'll come back, either through the inferior vena cava, superior vena cava, or coronary sinus, back to the right atrium. And then from the right atrium, we pump blood through the tricuspid valve to the right ventricle, and we continue on and on and on and on. So uh, that is the, how the heart in a nutshell, uh, where, where blood is and how, how we have adaptations for the different chambers of our heart. In the final video for this chapter, we're gonna go over the electrical uh, patterns in the heart. How does electricity, the flow of electricity lead to this pumping, the pattern that we saw, atrial, then ventricles, atrial, then ventricles, to make sure there's one way flow and assuring efficient pumping. So I'll see you in the next video. In the meantime, please let me know if you have any questions, any questions for the comments or discussion. Uh, I'll talk to y'all later.